place, but welcome to this session uh, of the CCCM Cluster Global Meeting. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at transition and the nexus. Um, before we do, I just want to take a little bit of time to reflect on what we did last week. So just having a look at where we are in terms of our map of our, of our event, we, we've already in the second week now on Monday the 9th down here with transition and the nexus. And I just wanted to see how much, if anything, and hopefully you do, you remember from the previous days. So we're gonna see if this will work, just to see if you're awake and see if you're with me, see if you've come back from your kitchen or your bathroom or wherever you've just been. Um, so let's go to Monday the 2nd. Let's think back to Monday the 2nd, our very first day when Juan and Dare and our working groups reminded us a little bit about where we are in terms of CCCM in 2020 and shared some updates. So if you can remember anything from that day, if you were at that day, type it into the chat now. And the first person to remember who isn't part of the organizing group delivering this event wins a superb prize. So what can you remember from day one? Type it into the chat. Anyone remember anything from day one? Who was there? People scratching their heads. So Juan's already stolen in with a working group drama. Juan, you're too quick. Anybody else remember anything from day one? What about where, where CCCM is in 2020? Any of the updates? Anything important that came out of day one for you? Not much. Everyone's too sleepy. Gosh, come on people. We're remembering what happened on Monday the 2nd on day one of this global event. Okay, nothing coming. Okay, so I've got a different plan. I've got three things for you. Let me show you. I've got a bin. I've also got a brush and I've got a big red bag. So with my bag and my brush and my bin or trash can, if you're from another part of the world, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. What I want you to do is I want you to think about last week and I want you to think about things that you might wanna just leave in this bin. I'll open it up, you pop them in. Things that you know weren't very good last week, it could be content, it could be something that was boring, it could be the method or the way it was presented. And I want you to think about something from last week that you will put in the bin. And then I want you to think about something that wasn't so terrible that you wanna put it in the bin, but you definitely need to brush it up a little bit something that needs a little bit of a clean, a little bit of a brush up. And then finally, I want you to think about something that you take away, something that was so valuable to you last week that you opened up your bag and you put it inside and you took it away. Does that make sense? So something that goes in the bin, something that you need to brush up and something that you want to take away in your bag from last week. And I am going to ask you to share those with us via a quick Mentimeter. So grab your phone. If you didn't do this last week, go to menti.com on your browser and tell us what is the thing you'd like to bin from last week? What wasn't very good in last week's sessions? What is the thing you'd like to brush up on that isn't so terrible we want to bin it, but we want to change it a little bit? And then finally, what are the things that you want to bag, you want to take home in your big red bag from last week's sessions? Take a minute to share those with us. Let's see what people think. See if you agree or disagree. Let's see your answers come up on the screen.
So we're thinking about last week's sessions, any of the sessions, doesn't have to be all of them. And we're thinking about things we'd like to bin, what we'd like to leave behind, because it wasn't any good. What we'd like to brush up on and change. And what we'd like to take away. So in what we want to be in, we've got technical glitches, technical problems, technical issues. I think there's a theme here. Problems with the videos. In Brush Up, interestingly, we've got more participants joining in. So here's your chance. I'm asking you to join in right now. Go ahead, join in. I know we've got in some of the sessions a design which will allow people to join in a little bit more as well. So that should be good. And then what people would like to take away, Practitioner's Day. Practitioner's Day was amazing. And if you weren't there, there were 22 sessions, bite-sized sessions, 15 or 30 minutes long some amazing presenters and a huge diversity. So I think in the afternoon, we had the United States government presenting its new approach to funding things like CCCM right alongside how you maintain cultural heritage when working directly with affected communities. That's a measure of the diversity we had in that session. It was incredible. And if you want to access any of the sessions from last week, or any of the sessions from the practitioners day, feel free to go to the website, CCCM website. There'll be a link arriving in the chat very soon, I'm sure, um, where you can access any of the videos um, of the sessions last week. So we're getting some things in our bag now to take away, which is good. We've got some more things to brush up, which is very helpful for us. More field examples, improving video sound, more breakout sessions, longer Q&A sessions. Okay, we're listening. We can try and change these things. Things we want to bin, basically the tech, isn't it? Gosh, look at this. It's all about the technology and connectivity. The explosive amount of participants this year. I'm not quite sure where we'd want to bin that. But maybe there's an issue in there for us to learn from. So I will leave this open. Feel free to keep adding to this. This helps us a great deal because it will allow us to shape the sessions for the rest of this week. We've got some interesting things coming up on Brush It Up now. And in Bagot, we've got some really good things now. Love Practitioner's Day. Do it more often with maybe a one or two days every couple of months. One's going to collapse to that. Look at her holding her head in her hands. She can't bear it. The idea of doing this every two months is exhausting. Okay, so I'm going to leave this open for you so you can continue to add to this if you'd like. Um, but in the meantime, what I wanted to do was introduce the session for today. Um, so we saw that we have come through half of the half of the overall meeting now, and we're now here on Monday the ninth with transition and the nexus. Um, that little star indicates that we just had a networking session, which about thirty people joined. So that was great, and they got a chance to meet each other and chat and share ideas and just find new colleagues, which was fantastic, or old friends. I think there was a book club going on as well, which is pretty fun. And what we're going to be doing today is focusing on transition and the nexus. So with Giovanni Cassini, but firstly, with one attempt to say her surname correctly, Sopo Panich. It's not bad. It's not bad. One over to you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, 
I have some construction work going on in my um, next door building, so apologize if it's noisy. And obviously my cat is now also feeling like it's her time to be on screen. Um, so today uh, we would like to be discussing, um, I think the idea of putting transition and nexus into practice. Um, I'm also very excited. I realize I have a few minutes um, ahead of Giovanni taking over, um, but I think I would also like to invite everyone, every participants to also listen to this conversation, put in your, con put in your questions, um, comments, um, and also at the same time, I think, take a think back over the last week, the different conversations we had about participation, about localization, um, area-based conversation, and, and see how this links up. I think a lot of the, we have some great speakers today, um, a great panel that I'm very excited to, to hear from. Um, so, and I think, think back of all these different components, we talk in the first week about how CCCM is sometimes really complicated and complex issues that we need, need to then simplify enough to be able to put them into practice. Um, and to adapt and change to the really dynamics and, uh, and complicated issues. Um, so I think with that in mind, so without further ado, and before my cat push everything off my kitchen counter, I'm gonna hand over to um, Giovanni Cassani, who's the head for stakeholder engagement and coordination for the UN high level panel on IDPs who's going to be a moderator for today's session. Over to you, Giovanni. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me um, well. Thank you so much. Excellent. Great to be with you all. Um, let me start my uh, notes. So I'm here, my name is uh, Giovanni Cassani and I'm the head of stakeholder engagement and coordination for the high level panel on internal displacement. Uh, let me say a few words about the high level panel. The high level panel was established by the UN Secretary General in October, 2019. And the objective was to critically re-examine the a global engagement when it comes to IDPs or internal displacement in general. And the idea is for this panel to provide concrete recommendations for effective prevention, response, and support to durable solutions. And this report aims to look at the role that each and every actor can play in this role, be it states at different levels from the uh, local levels to the top level, um, United Nations, meaning all agencies that are involved in the process, um, NGOs, uh, private sector, civil society, and any other players or stakeholders, including donors. So this is a massive undertaking. This exercise is ongoing. Uh, the panel is composed, uh, the high level panel, is composed of eight uh, eminent uh, politicians that are leading the, uh, the effort and by four expert advisors. Uh, those are mostly um, academics and they are supporting the panel in their deliberation. The panel is co-chaired by Federica Mogherini, who is a former high representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs also a vice president of the European Union and a former uh, foreign minister of Italy. And is also co-chaired by Donald Caberuca, Dr. Donald Caberuca, who is currently the chair of the board of the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. But he's also a former president of the African Development Bank. So to give you a sense, uh, the reason why those very high calibers were chosen uh, to be part of this panel, it's because uh, this panel has, is very ambitious. Um, it has uh, the objective of really proposing a bold and game-changing recommendation for the humanitarian sector. And that's why a group of such eminent uh, politicians was uh, selected. The panel, uh, 
uh, met for the first time in, in January uh, 2020. And right after that, unfortunately, it was, um, of course, uh, affected by COVID um, because the panel was meant to travel to a number of countries in a number of regions around the world uh, to be able to solicit feedback and uh, recommendations and talk to actors uh, involved in different responses, talk to IDPs themselves, host communities. And this has been obviously challenged by COVID-19. Um, this has basically pushed the whole um, exercise to be reorganized and rescheduled. So somehow the report that was meant to um, be handed over to the Secretary General in February 2021 has now been uh, postponed and it will be handed over to the Secretary General by September 2021. And the panel had to reorganize its work um, in order to kind of use you know, all the online means possible in order to reach the different stakeholders and the different actors um, involved in this discussion. So, so far, the panel has been able to be in touch with a lot of the external stakeholders, but mostly through virtual means. This does not exclude that we might, that the panel might be able to organize some physical visits, um, but this is still very much a, a, a difficult uh, uh, exercise. We had, for example, a visit planned for this week uh, to uh, go to um, Rome, um, to talk to the Italian government and the Vatican, but unfortunately that visit had to be postponed during, due, due to the prevailing COVID uh, situations in Italy. In any case, the panel has been able to try to understand the dynamics around ADPs, the increase in numbers, the uh, multi-casuality factors that are pushing people um, to leave their homes, the social and economic fragilities that are underlying a lot of the displacement, uh, the cost of non-engaging in displacement early, and obviously has been able to do so by alternative means. Um, the panel has been able to ask uh, different constituencies for written feedback and recommendations. And we have so far received around 92 uh, written recommendations, 30 of whom from um, member states, and among them around 14 from affected member states. But the panel has also been able to um, understand and hear the voices of IDPs, uh, mostly through um, uh, partners on the ground that have been able to conduct interviews, uh, surveys, focus group discussion with IDPs, and have been able to summarize all the discussion and send them up the chain uh, to the panel who's looking at them as we speak. So today, and the exercise of today, is an opportunity to hear your recommendation. First of all, the recommendations of uh, the panel member that we have invited for the meeting today, but also to hear the recommendations coming from some of you in the audience on ways in which um, this particular uh, IDP system can be tackled, and in particular, focusing on the issue of the day, which is very much um, around the transition and the issue of the nexus. So how to deal with that specific moment in the arch of displacement of uh, uh, IDPs, which has to do with the, the durable solution phase and the nexus when all the actors on the ground are supposed to take, um, to take steps to work together and work with each other. Um, I'm talking about the, the external actors, the UN and the NGOs. I'm talking about the government who is on the lead, particularly when it comes to this phase in general, but uh, in particular when it comes to this phase of leading uh, the durable solution process, civil society, academia, private sector, all of the different actors that are involved in this very delicate phase that you know, so far we are struggling to handle in a very appropriate and effective way. Um, there's, a, there's a feeling that the humanitarian phase is reasonably well understood and structured, but when it comes to the durable solution phase, the nexus phase, that's where a lot of the challenges uh, are uh, happening and potentially also contributing to the prolonged nature of displacement that we're seeing more and more across the, the world. 
in order to discuss on this very delicate phase of the, uh, the, the response to displacement, we have gathered today a panel of very eminent uh, speakers uh, that will be able to discuss with a lot of experience on their shoulders uh, about this uh, phase of transition. They will be able to tell us you know, what they feel it works in this phase and what they feel it doesn't work in this phase. And they will be able to really kind of cast some light on what it takes to give um, dignity back to the people that are displaced and allow them to restart a normal life. In order to discuss all of this, um, I have, uh, we have today gathered here a group of uh, three experts. Um, let me introduce them one by one in the same order in which they will speak after me. The first person that we have um, with us today is from the Nigerian government. His name is Charles Wanelo Anailo, and he is the deputy director of the Humanitarian Affairs Department, the Department of the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, and Social Development. He represents today uh, the minister, Honorable Sadia Umar Farouk, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management, Social Development, who uh, could not make it uh, and she had some last minute engagements. Uh, so she's not gonna be able to be with us. So this is our first speaker. We then have Hoshang Mohammed Abdurrahman. He is the Director General of the JCC, the Joint Crisis Coordination Center in Iraq. Um, he is part of the Ministry of Interior of Kurdistan. Uh, he's a very strong partner of the humanitarian response uh, in the Kurdish region of Iraq. Um, he works both on the IDP response and also on the refugee uh, uh, kind of response in the north of uh, uh, Iraq, um, or particularly in Kurdistan. Uh, I just want to highlight that the, um, uh, the setup of Iraq is as such that he, the coverage of other areas of Iraq might have different policies and uh, might have different uh, kind of rules and um, um, let's say um, um, current um, ongoing decisions um, that, that might be different from what's going on in the Kurdistan region. And finally, I would like to introduce Nigel Fisher, who is a disaster management and recovery consultant uh, multi azar risk analysis and international crisis management uh, consultant. But um, he's, I guess, here in his capacity as a former assistant secretary general. Um, he was in charge of the, it was the humanitarian, regional humanitarian coordinator for the Syria crisis um, up until August 2014. And before he was the Special Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General in Haiti, uh, just after the earthquake. He occupied similar positions in the past in Afghanistan, and he's a former uh, Executive Director of uh, UNOPS. Uh, his previous career is with UNICEF, um, mostly in Africa, Middle East, and Asia. So he comes to this discussion with years of experience of collaborating with different governments across the world in dealing with the issue of displacement, and not only in the early phases, but throughout, uh, from you know the early displacement to the return uh, phases. So, um, without further ado. I would like to introduce or to let to give the floor to our panelists, but I would just kind of ask you to, um, in the meantime, to, for the rest of the audience, to prepare for some key questions, to listen carefully to what they say, because we are going to have a debate after that. We're going to try to uh, ask uh, some of the experts on the um, on the panel today some of their advice, suggestions, feedback uh, when it comes to this very intricate phase of. The nexus and the durable solution. So over to our first uh, um, speaker, Charles Wandelo Anaelo. Thank you.
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Governor, for the uh, introduction. And uh, I thank all of you who are participating in this uh, meeting. Um, uh, you have already uh, mentioned who I am, and uh, I want to say that uh, I am here, like you rightly said, uh, on behalf of the, the Honorable Minister, uh, who uh, has sent her compliments. And uh, before uh, today, she has been preparing for this event, uh, which she considers a veritable platform to, to share the experience of Nigeria and as well as also to learn from uh, uh, other countries the best practices they are presenting. Uh, but uh, due to other uh, national assignments, which she was drafted into by Mr. President, uh, unfortunately, she will not be here in person. And uh, uh, I have been directed uh, to sit in for her and then do my best uh, to represent her uh, in this uh, very important panel. Uh, uh, I probably want to you probably ask me to uh, thank the organizers uh, for considering it uh, Nigeria worthy to be part of this experience sharing. And uh, for us, it is an important uh, subject uh, because uh, uh, the, 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 the phase we are in now on the issues of, uh, uh, of uh, the issues of uh, displacement is uh, the, the phase of the, the, the transition and the, and the nexus. And uh, the, the government of Nigeria to that effect has been making a uh, a, a whole lot of efforts uh, to improve on aspect of uh, infrastructure and uh, improve uh, security and uh, ensure a, a presence of a, a civil servant in an affected zone of, of the, 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 the return population to have a conducive environment for continued stay. Uh, that is to say that uh, the government of Nigeria uh, presently is focused on uh, ensuring a uh, a return and also building the resilience and the, the infrastructure of, of the environment to ensure that uh, the, 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 the environment uh, is, is, is conducive uh, for, the, for the returnees. And uh, the effort Nigerians are making is, uh, is uh, calculated in, in various plans and the strategies that the Nigerian government has uh, developed. And uh, one of uh, uh, such plan is the Buhari plan uh, within the Buhari plan, we have uh, two strategic pillars, uh, which has to do with the issues of uh, social stabilization and uh, protection, and uh, also the issues of uh, early recovery. Uh, these two pillars uh, also speaks to the subject that we are discussing here today. And uh, uh, also the another plan, uh, uh, which is uh, we are implementing in, uh, in, in, in addressing the issues of a uh, transition analysis is uh, the economic uh, recovery and the growth plan. Uh, this plan of government uh, focuses on investment in infrastructure to create a, a kind of enabling environment for growth, uh, industrial competitiveness, uh, as well as a sustainable uh, development. Um, uh, uh, the, Last but not the least in the plan I want to share with you here today is equally the Bruno uh, State uh, 10 Years uh, Strategic uh, Transformation Plan. And uh, this plan uh, focuses on issues of uh, complete development and uh, a way of uh, addressing the nexus, uh, the triple nexus between humanitarian development and uh, peace nexus. And uh, so these plans are what the government are focusing in addressing the issues and uh, making a frantic effort in ensuring that uh, the issues of, of uh, transition and measures is uh, properly uh, and adequately and handled. Uh, yes, uh, 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 apart from all this, uh, the government of Nigeria uh, still acknowledges uh, the, the challenges of uh, insecurity uh, and the uh, varying conditions in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in different uh, local uh, 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 government areas. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we, the government is so uh, a pragmatic uh, uh, approach uh, in, in, in pursuing uh, and also uh, uh, where prioritization of uh, emergency contest is still being maintained. Uh, that is to say that uh, apart from the, the, the transition and the nexus and the exit plan, the federal government of Nigeria is still also ensuring that the humanitarian life-saving intervention are still being provided uh, so that uh, uh, people will not be abandoned only waiting for to be provided a durable solution 
uh, 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 program. And uh, also the, uh, the government of Nigeria is not just only, uh, uh, is uh, rather is focusing on the, the whole of government approach. And uh, that is why at the state level, uh, the Brunei state government, for example, is engaging with the donors uh, and uh, the UN and the ed agencies in, in, in development of a, a return strategy and a, a, a policy framework to, uh, to avoid a forced return and promote uh, durable solutions. Uh, for Nigeria, the voluntary nature of returns uh, needs to be maintained. It's very, it's, that is of an essence to us while pursuing the long-term transition and, uh, and the recovery. Uh, yes, we have mentioned the various plans uh, that Nigeria is uh, drawing their, their, their operation from. And uh, we equally uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, there is a need for those plans to be synchronized and, uh, and uh, to ensure coherence in, in, in all this implementation. And uh, uh, that is why the uh, government of Nigeria has uh, also established uh, the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, Disaster Management and, uh, and uh, Social Development uh, to ensure that uh, there is a, a, a kind of a, a, a synchrony and the coherence in the implementation of all the plans and to ensure that uh, they are focused uh, towards achieving a, a, a common goal. Um, beyond uh, this, uh, there are certain key uh, points uh, I would like us to note on this, uh, uh, which uh, are the strategies that, that Nigeria are looking up and also working uh, towards in ensuring this implementation. And one of them is the, a, a, a key-based approach. Uh, Nigerian uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, the key, uh, I mean, uh, an area-based approach to durable solution uh, that is an effective, uh, very effective in, gui in guiding interventions in return areas. Uh, therefore, uh, the government of uh, Nigeria and the humanitarian partners have been adopting the area-based approach in locations with the IDTs, uh, returnees, and the host uh, 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 communities. Um, the uh, approach, the, the approach uh, ensures uh, that uh, there is a, a, a kind of a harmonious relation between different sectoral interventions to achieve the same goal and uh, providing an enabling environment to all the all, all players. Uh, this aims at the overall recovery and the resilience building in the uh, of the uh, conflict uh, affected population, conflict affected population, and also it contributes to the community recovery and uh, intervention. Uh, now the next point uh, is the uh, stability index. Uh, uh, a lot of support. Uh, has been provided to return policy making and the early recovery planning through a stability index, uh, which allows uh, which allows a monitoring of a stability in return areas, uh, and also enabling partners to uh, to uh, better develop strategies and plan of operation for intervention that integrate uh, uh, humanitarian uh, recovery and the stabilization component, the triple nexus. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the survey, and uh, uh, a lot of surveys have been conducted, and the reports help to identify pockets of uh, stability to aid programming in these locations, and also allow for a detailed and a better understanding and the evolution of, uh, of returns. Uh, the third point I would like us to note here is the issue of uh, return intention surveys and the village assessment surveys. Uh, and this is one key area where uh, we, uh, we are being conducted uh, 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 in displacement site to, uh, to support uh, identification of durable solution for the displaced population and advocating for safe and voluntary returns. As you may know that the uh, environment differs. Uh, what is suitable for, the, the, for one environment for durable solution may not be suitable for the other. So there is a need to uh, can, uh, carry a survey to ensure that uh, uh, whatever a durable solution that we deem provided is suitable to that particular environment. And uh, on, the, on the side of uh, the village assessment survey, uh, uh, we have conducted to support dignified and identified programming and, and identify the returning, uh, returning, returning areas, providing much needed information to planners uh, about the uh, needs of a large population of returnees and uh, the gap services and for making reintegration programs more effective and uh, relevant and realistic. 
So all these surveys are, are there to assist to ensure that uh, uh, there is uh, adequate information for the program officers to, so that to, to plan and to ensure that uh, the planning is evidence-based. And uh, uh, the, the, the next one I would probably like to mention is the issues of the information management uh, net, 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 net networks. Uh, uh, the government has supported this, the information management networks, uh, through the displacement track, uh, tracking metrics, DTM, and the food security uh, via the code the humanize and the, and the sector uh, data from the, the humanitarian coordination clusters, uh, uh, giving a more complete operational picture for agencies to plan their, their, their humanitarian and uh, recovery, recovery work. Um, uh, beyond all this, there is still a, a, a need for improvement in, in, in certain areas. And uh, uh, one area we consider uh, very important and, and uh, very necessary for improvement is the area of uh, coordination, very area of coordination. Uh, as you may know that uh, 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 there are multiplicity of uh, stakeholders involved in the transition, a uh, multiplicity of the uh, transition. And, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, based on that, uh, the federal government at the national level has, uh, has uh, 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 established the, uh, the, the ministry with the mandate, with the mandate to ensure that uh, there is a coordinated approach in all the activities. And uh, this coordination is complemented by the decentralized, uh, decentralized co uh, uh, coordination and decision making at the level of the, of the states. And, uh, and, and the region and the uh, level of regional and the state level. Um, uh, and that is why the, 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 the Northeast Development Commission uh, is being established and uh, is heading the reconstruction and the rehabilitation effort in the Northeast specifically in collaboration with the other agencies. And uh, this arrangement needed to be strengthened. Uh, even though it is now we are we are operating on that, but we believe that there's need to strengthen uh, this arrangement to ensure uh, 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 coherence in all that. Um, the uh, another issue I want to raise on this issue to be improved is the issues of uh, uh, the Nexus Working Group and the uh, Nexus Task Force, which we have been established. And uh, uh, presently, uh, uh, effort is being made to ensure that their operation is uh, 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 is all inclusive. It all inclusive. And uh, let me also uh, 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 state that, uh, uh, that Nigeria uh, as a country believes that uh, uh, alternative and the innovative settlement types can equally be developed. Though uh, the agency of the federal government, NEMA, that is the National Emergency Management Agency, uh, who is the, the focal agency uh, responsible uh, or the lead of the CCCM, and the shelters to identify a sector, they have already suggested a, 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 a resettlement approach. And this approach involves land advocacy for identifying and the securing stable uh, 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 pieces of land, site and the settlement planning, uh, following global and the local standard. And uh, the settlement approach also advocates for transitional approach to shelter construction in different uh, phases. Uh, the last point I, I would like to make uh, so that I'll give the floor to other uh, panelists is that uh, 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 the issues of uh, information management is very crucial. Uh, it cannot be overemphasized in, the issue, in, in addressing the issues of transition and the nexus. Therefore, the, uh, hence the government of Nigeria have realized this and is making an effort to improve access to information for various stakeholders by engaging in partnership with uh, various uh, humanitarian partners. Uh, all this government of effort is what the federal government is making as relate to this nexus. Let me stop here and also listen to my colleagues maybe so that I will learn more about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Anelo. I think your intervention was to the point and, and, and super interesting. I'm sure there's follow-ups on some of the points you mentioned about uh, um, you know, things to improve. I think there's, there's, I'm sure there's lots of people in the, in the audience that would like to find out a bit more about what you just said. Uh, now I leave the floor to Oshang Mohammed, 
uh, for his intervention uh, from um, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Over to you, Oshan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us to this uh, event. Uh, I'm very pleased to share with you our lessons, good lessons, also, you know, bad lessons, what we have done since 2014 to face the crisis that have been facing us in Iraq as a country and also in Kurdistan region, as a federal region in Iraq. So I would like to just brief you what happened in 2013 after ISIS was taken one third of the country in Iraq in June uh, 2014. We have faced the largest humanitarian crisis, you know, by definition of the UN at that time. Over 4 million people were uh, displaced within a couple of uh, weeks or a month uh, across uh, four provinces. And uh, everybody, everyone in the, I mean, the government institutions and politicians were taken by surprise and many of them were actually shocked. And no agency, no government agency, no entity was uh, were prepared for responding or coordinating or leading the emergency response for such a large scale crisis. I remember it very well. We've had uh, millions of people in our uh, gates once to enter the cities to the provinces in Kurdistan region and also in many other provinces across uh, Iraq. So at that time, you know, since no one was prepared, uh, many of the uh, local governors actually stopped or uh, trying to stop people to enter their provinces, you know, uh, since uh, there was no capacity or at least, you know, very limited capacity of the administration to deal with this uh, uh, crisis. And we were faced, you know, a lot of challenges, you know, at that time, and it was very difficult, you know, for us to deal with a, such a, to deal with a, such a big uh, crisis. For instance, we didn't have, you know, at the federal level and also at the regional level of the Kurdistan regional government, any agency to lead the crisis coordination within the government entities, also with the UN agencies, the NGOs, international partners to coordinate, you know, all of the efforts and to respond to the crisis. And, and then we didn't have any clear processes for issuing emergency visas, you know, for the international staff, they were uh, coming, you know, or being deployed by the humanitarian partners, you know, upon the request of the government to support, you know, the local authorities, also federal and regional uh, government. And addition, another problem also, there was a, you know, no clear processes for logistics coordination uh, and custom clearances for the humanitarian assistance being shipped you know, to assist the, the displaced people. This was also one of the critical challenges at that time. I remember it very well, we, we faced and it, it, it has made it difficult for our partners you know, to expedite the process of shipping uh, their assistance into the country and being uh, sent to the displaced uh, people across the Kurdistan region and also other provinces uh, in Iraq. And also another problem, there was no emergency fund at the federal level or at the Kurdistan regional government level to provide, you know, or to immediately, you know, release the required funds to the local administrations, you know, to respond to the crisis uh, at that time. And this was also a clear problem. Another issue, you know, we have found that at that time, there was no also, you know, standards or criteria for the minimum, you know, assistance that each family, each dis displaced individual needs to be provided. And also no criteria or no standard uh, for uh, providing a shelter. What, what kind of shelter we have to provide for the displaced people. So this was uh, a very uh, challenging time and critical uh, problems for us. As, uh, we can say there was a gap in the government, in the structure of the government at that time. And then it is, there was also a problem for logistic, uh, you know, logistics operational capacity of the government at the federal level, also at the regional level, and also at the provincial level, you know, to uh, move or to transport, you know, required, you know, assistance to the displaced people of, uh, across uh, the country. This was also a critical uh, 
capacity gap that we faced at that uh, time. And then another issue, actually, as you all may remember, there was also active fighting you know, across the country with ISIS. Uh, for instance, in the region, we've had the over 1,000 kilometers uh, fighting with the ISIS. And uh, well, the issue with that, how we can, uh, there was a lack of experience and expertise and information for civil coordination. Our the civilian you know, institutions to coordinate with these uh, military apparatus, security apparatus, they were in active fighting you know, uh, with ISIS and we were facing waves of displacement, people fleeing from the ISIS controlled areas or the war zones. This was also one of the challenges that at that time we've had. And therefore what happened? Every single ministry departments were trying to do something individually, not coordinated, not in a concerted efforts to face this large scale uh, crisis uh, in, the, uh, in 2014 or what. What happened, you know, with the support and advice and uh, of our partners, especially UN agencies, we have had a lot of high level discussions, you know, at the peak of the crisis and also ongoing and still ongoing, how we can feel, you know, this structural problems and this uh, issues to face, you know, to the crisis, you know, in a systematic, in a coordinated and concerted efforts within the government, our structures at the regional level, also provincial level, also with the federal uh, government. So what we have done, you know, to share with you some, uh, lessons or uh, steps that you have taken quickly at that time, you know, to face this and to fill these uh, gaps was uh, challenging for us, but uh, we did uh, made some quick uh, uh, policies and also quick steps we have taken, you know, to fill these gaps. Like we have also in the Kurdistan region and also in Baghdad, quickly we have established the crisis coordination agency to fill the gaps that we are facing in the in the coordination among within the government entities, also with the, our partners, UN agencies, NGOs, donor countries, so many people, volunteers, you know, they were coming. And also between the regional government, also with federal government, and then within our you know entities to ensure a proper structured coordination uh, to respond to the humanitarian crisis and displacement crisis that we have uh, faced. And then development of clear processes and operation procedures, you know, to streamline and expedite the visa issuance, custom clearances, and also the coordination structure at the policy level, highest level between uh, regional government and federal government, and also UN country team to ensure the policies that has been endorsed, strategies that has been uh, uh, <clears throat> approved as uh, jointly jointly endorsed and jointly being implemented you know on the ground at the operational level and then we have also taking benefit from the presence of uh, huge expertise with un agencies and we have taken their advice you know to especially regarding the emergency response like you know providing uh, shelters and also assistance provisions and also, you know, the protection issues for the displaced uh, people and also minimum standards that required, you know, for the shelter, for the assistance. So we quickly have, you know, benefited from huge experience that UN has and uh, through engagement and direct consultation and cooperation coordination, we have been able to quickly, you know, adopt the best international uh, uh, practices that can be translated in our you know, context in Kurdistan region to implement, to support the displaced uh, people, this, uh, to support the displaced uh, people. And then after that, you know, we actually at, the, at that time, uh, we, we didn't want, you know, to, to, uh, to resort to camp uh, establishment. But when we have a look at millions of people, majority of them have nothing in their position. They just left it with their, you know, shoes on. Even some didn't have shoes on their on their feet. They just came. Most of them were very vulnerable. What happened? Our government, you know, have decided, you know, to construct, you know, 
camps for these displaced people with the support of uh, uh, shelter, you know, clusters within UN, which was led by UNHCR and some other uh, uh, local NGOs. So we were able, you know, to quickly establish camps. So I will come later, you know, about the uh, positive side and negative side of constructing uh, camps. Uh, but this was the only solution. So we were able to provide, you know, around at that time, 37% uh, of uh, IDPs, you know, to shelter them in the camps. We used uh, to have 58 camps at the peak of the displacement in 2016. So <clears throat> this was another uh, area. And the other was we were, uh, allow, uh, we were, uh, we were, we uh, were, issuing a policy to allow all of the displaced people who can survive in the city so to join you know families to live with friends or informal settlements uh, within the cities and towns in the Kurdistan region so this has been made a huge you know social impact financial impact on the our services and on our you know local authorities to meet the 30% increase of the population within uh, weeks as I've said, no one was prepared, and it was everywhere, you know, a shock to the communities, to the administrations, very difficult time. What we have adopted with the support of our partners, for instance, you know, certain strategies, you know, to meet the needs of the uh, IDPs and to ensure, you know, the social ties, coexistence, and social cohesion is sustained, you know, between host communities and also with the displaced uh, people uh, in our region. For instance, we were having inclusive programs, you know, not only supporting displaced people after they were settled in the cities or in the camps, we also supported equally the most vulnerable people among host communities to ensure we are keeping and sustaining uh, the social cohesion and also sustaining the, 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 the peaceful coexistence of the IEPs and also the host uh, communities. And then in the middle of the you know crisis, we also discussed immediately you know how to we have to change our strategy from emergency response, humanitarian assistance, all to be linked with the, or bridged with the resiliency building, resiliency building you know of the displaced people and also of the most vulnerable host communities, as on the one side and on the second side to ensure the local authorities leadership in the crisis response and humanitarian crisis management we also focused on the resiliency building of the local institutions so they will be able you know to be in the driving seat uh, response rather than you know we do it uh, on their behalf and tomorrow if we won't be able to continue what they will be doing. And this has been also the strategy we have endorsed with our UN agency partners. And seeing this, we have been step by step, you know, handing over the responsibility to the local authority, you know, so they themselves own the, the whole, you know, crisis response coordination and management, and also leading to ensure, you know, what we are doing is sustainable after we are, withdrawing as a regional government uh, and also other our partners like UN uh, agency. And this has been, I can say, successful uh, approaches that we have uh, endorsed, but uh, also, you know, if it, they would, I can say when we go back and we do the retreat strategy, they would have been many other uh, uh, ways, you know, we would have, if I, uh, if I know what I know now, if I would have known before, actually, there's many uh, sectors or many things we would have done differently. For instance, at the very beginning, in terms of shelters, everybody was thinking this crisis is a short term, three months to six months. So we just set up something to have people in. But ever since, we are every year we are investing you know in these camps and it has been taken almost six years people living in the camps and i can say in terms of cost i can say it's triple time more if you would have thought at the very beginning to have a proper shelters and you know with proper infrastructure for the people rather than you know thinking you know short term you know at that time uh, it was i think uh, 
uh, a wrong uh, thinking uh, of this uh, shelter approach to supporting uh, the people. And still the shelters, you know, uh, are not, uh, uh, the camps are not uh, according to the best international standards. We have, there's still a lot of gap. And even, even one, sometimes if we want now to, to upgrade, you know, the, the, the standards, actually there's no space simply, for instance. There's no proper, you know, ways, you know, to, to improve it because the, all of the camps were constructed as an emergency shelter. I think this was uh, one of the mistakes, you know, and now we are facing the protracted displacement crisis. It's almost six years. For Syrian refugees, this is also applied to them. They came in 2012. Uh, it's the same, uh, I think, uh, same uh, issue still we are uh, facing. And then uh, another issue, you know, we would have done it actually uh, was uh, especially this applied to the, I can say, to the federal region. You know, this is my assessment. Actually, this was also, I think, uh, we shouldn't repeat this, you know, for any, you know, crisis, and this was not good. For instance, uh, during the crisis in 2014, all of the federal, mini federal ministries, they opened offices in the governorates and in the Kurdistan region. So like Ministry of Health, like Ministry of Education, like Ministry of Migration and Displacement, and also this was not our, uh, the right approach because they were you know, somehow replacing the local authorities to assist the displaced people. But now they couldn't continue. Instead, I think what we they should have done you know, differently, we should have strengthened the local authorities, provided them with the required resources, with the like funds, like materials, equipment, and also human resources, but we should have, you know, we should have ensured, enabled the local authorities to lead the whole of process. And this was, uh, the cost would have been less and ownership would have been stronger and leadership would have been uh, uh, sustaining uh, by the local authorities. This was one of the also issues that we have faced with the federal government. You know, the colleagues now who are hearing me, uh, they have been, uh, my, my those who have been in Iraq and in Kurdistan region, uh, they know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, about this uh, issue. Because just maintaining the administrative and operation costs of all of the offices, it's too much. I mean, in terms of finance, in terms of human resources, was too much. Instead, you know, having, replacing the local authorities, these resources should have been uh, directed to the local structures local administrative, you know, offices and structures already there. So, and if the, I think like uh, UN somehow was approach, uh, UN approach was completely different, either, you know, completely, you know, working, you know, in partnership with the authorities or supporting them to do it. UN approach was much more practical if you compare, you know, to the federal government in terms of providing support to the local authorities, either doing it, you know, together with the local authorities or providing the support, the needed support for the local authorities. So they were doing it. They were leading the process, the response, the camp management administration across the Kurdistan region. So this has been uh, one of the issue and still uh, continuing because uh, this would have not ensured, you know, the local leadership. That's why in the Kurdistan region, actually, we changed our, you know, policy differently from the federal government. So we were trying, you know, at the ministry level, at the regional level, you know, to ensure a local leadership, but top-down support. So our ministry shouldn't go and do the, the work on behalf of local administration. No, in, instead, we are providing what we can to the local administration so they will lead the process coordination, emergency response, camp management, camp administration, uh, protection issues, uh, all of this, you know, and service provision, expansion to the camps and also outside camps. And if you look at it, actually, 
this has been so successful and we have uh, had you know several different models i mean approaches developed uh, you know by local uh, provincial administrations in kurdistan region and each model has its own strengths and also uh, weaknesses but i i i as i strongly believe it's uh, it has been uh, successful successful uh, this approach so and in regards to the return process you know it has been very problematic because uh, it was not only due due to the lack of a polar joint policy actually at the very beginning but also the areas were under ISIS either the infrastructure in some areas uh, over 80% uh, you know destroyed services were you know unavailable uh, you know community houses were destroyed some areas less in a in average you know was varying degrees but most of the areas severely you know impacted especially the big cities when there was heavy street fighting for the intentionally by ISIS and also for the collateral uh, damage this is on one hand and on the second hand you know the social problems that has been, you know, left as a consequences of uh, ISIS war and also consequences of as some tribes, people joined ISIS, they committed crimes against their next door neighbors, you know, a lot of, you know, critical issues, legal issues, crime issues, and money in dismissed people, and uh, property, you know, occupation by remaining people. It's, this was uh, very problematic. And then also the, the issue of, you know, armed forces, you know, in their areas like, you know, armed groups, militia groups, you know, scattered and uh, proliferated, you know, in many areas, and this has been, you know, issues uh, across the board. How to make, you know, the return sustainable? Shang, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to say that we are trying to aim to pass the floor to Nigel in the next three minutes. So I wanted okay. to ask you if you can please. Uh, Surely, surely. I think three minutes, I'm almost uh, finished. Just uh, so in the Kurdistan region, we have uh, endorsed a uh, voluntary return for the IDPs and we have been facilitating uh, the return process with the UN agencies and also with our federal uh, ministries in Baghdad, all of the voluntary returns. And since you know, 2017, we have been able to help over 650,000 people to return from Kurdistan region to the place of origin. And now we are working you know, to the difficult or tough areas to normalize so we can help people to go back like Sinjar. A recent agreement has been made so we can uh, help, you know, the Sinjari people to go back. There are around 250,000 people. So I, my final point, I'd like to highlight actually, you know, the, the outstanding role that our partners have been playing since 2014, uh, because I don't want to miss this important past, like in UN agencies and also NGOs, they have been, uh, critical, you know, in strengthening our efforts and in supporting our efforts, you know, to meet the, the requirements, emergency needs of the people, to call, to respond to the emergencies. And they have been uh, fundamental partners on the ground with us day and night and working to reach, in, you know, far, you know, difficult areas, even in the war zones during the fighting with ISIS, you know, they have mobilized, you know, required resources to the displaced people, to the government agency. They have provided, you know, government, you know, entities with the funding and they have provided technical assistance to strengthen government, you know, operational capacities at different levels, provincial level, regional level and federal level. And also deployment, this was also very, very, you know, important for us at that time, the deployment of international experts, you know, and being seconded within our entities like, you know, JCC, uh, we have benefited a lot from international experts. They have been working for, uh, you know, with us within our office to, to strengthen our uh, capacities and develop the, the, the standards, operational, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> procedures, you know, to, uh, to crisis response and crisis uh, coordination and also to the camp co-administration, camp management, it was something for us new. 
So we have benefited and have taken advantage from presence of these international experts. And all of them have been provided by UN agencies and international you know, partners. I, I personally believe it was very, very you know, successful approach by UN agencies. And we are still continuing with this uh, cooperation. And also the, the, the advices, the advice and experts at the highest level, policy level, and also to the operational level, the UN agencies and partners clusters have been providing was also I found it you know very useful, and we have learned a lot from this experience to create our own procedures and processes in, in Kurdistan region. So I my final point I would say that you know without uh, if I look back and uh, without the international support from our partners, UN agencies, NGOs, and donor countries. I can say that it would have been actually much more difficult for the displaced people and for our own you know, uh, authorities in the Kurdistan region and also in the federal government to face this crisis. And to be honest, I, it would have been a complete you know, disaster or catastrophe if we didn't have this uh, international partners you know, present with us and supporting us in Kurdistan region, and I can say also across the, the country. And now we are continuing you know, to develop uh, the processes you know, to support the return you know, in Kurdistan region, like with the IOM for the IDPs, and also with the UNSCR for the Syrian refugees, you know, to go back. So I'll stop here and we'll be happy to get taking any questions and thank you very much again. Thank you so much, uh, Kako Shang. It's always a pleasure to hear you and I'm glad to see you again on screen uh, for now. Um, we will come back to you with questions uh, at some point. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience that have <laughs> follow-up questions. Without further ado, I now pass the floor to, to Nigel for a reflection on, on all that has been said and is, you know, throwing his, his experience and his advice and feedback into this. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. First of all, can you hear me? Good. Well, good morning from the west coast of Canada, where it's not yet seven in the morning, but I've had my coffee. Um, I'm really glad to be on the panel, and uh, especially as... Uh, Charles is speaking, and I started off my international development life in a small village in River State in Nigeria quite a few years ago. And then with Hoshanga, I also spent a year in Erbil in 1992 after the first Gulf War. So I'm back amongst old friends. Perhaps I shouldn't mention Giovanni that we also worked together when you were part of an outstanding IOM team in Haiti. And um, one of the strongest memories I have of you is sweating profusely and dancing enormously in what I would call a lively musical event. So anyway, um, if I, somebody would ask me the question, have humanitarian communities moved forward in putting the nexus into practice? I'd, kind of, I'd say kind of, uh, but probably not far enough. And then what are the biggest stumbling blocks or key areas that we need to focus on? Well, there are lots, uh, institutional, systemic, attitudinal, for example. But uh, I'd like to take a bird's eye view of perhaps five of these areas today, uh, which I believe we need to focus on. And they are the following. One is localization, or I prefer the word accompaniment. Uh, I know you've considered this a lot today, but I, I really think that has to be at the consistent heart of what we talk about. Second one is the issue of continuity or lack of it. Third is sector-based, area-based, one, both. The fourth is the issue of dignity, which has been mentioned. Uh, and where its place is at the center of the humanitarian and development action. And then finally, I'd like to end up with a few features of our system uh, and talk about that. So the first key area, localization or a better word, accompaniment. You've already looked at localization on day two. Uh, my impression is the international humanitarians are still looking at this from inside the humanitarian bubble. Even look at the question we had um, for day five today. Do we, humanitarians, make it more difficult than it should be to hand over to them local actors? That's it. right there, I see a perceptual issue. Handing over means that implies that we're in charge, or we think we are. Uh, but we need to move beyond the paternalistic underpinnings of international humanitarian action, uh, the parachuting in of international, the International Light Brigade, all too often with a limited understanding of national and local contexts. 
and cultural and social dynamics or national capabilities, uh, whether at the organization or individual level. So we really need to shift seriously to a new headspace, that of localization. As I said, I think an even better term for that is accompaniment, uh, which was championed by Paul Farmer, the co-founder of Partners of Health uh, in, in Haiti. And in a nutshell, the idea of accompaniment is that we external actors show up in a crisis or recovery situation to accompany national and local actors in their determination of the way forward, their priorities and approaches, and that we are ready and willing to get out of the way when we're no longer needed. First responders are always local, always. They're in action before we invade. So we often don't recognize them and we frequently displace, displace, them, displace them when we arrive in large numbers. As a better option, how can we external actors help their response and sub subsequent recovery capacities? So how can we support them? Well, it requires contextual knowledge, nothing that I'm sure you haven't talked about, but we need to re-emphasize. It requires dialogue between local and external actors before the disaster or crisis hits. Who are the local partners at all levels? How do they organize? What's their experience? How do they perceive their needs and priorities in preparing for and responding to disaster and displacement? How can we support and accompany them? I think it's too late to start finding this out when we arrive in a post-disaster drove. And if we don't know it at the outside, it's unlikely that we'll be ready in the transition phase or the nexus. Okay, that's point one. So the second key area, the issue of continuity or lack of it. I really feel that international actors have to be present and participating on a continuous basis in the development process, as well as during the humanitarian crisis, in the process of disaster preparedness, and not just in disaster response. This means that we do need to go a heck of a lot further in breaking down the humanitarian development divide and having many more people, especially those in leadership positions, who can operate in both development and crisis management settings. It's very, it's very harmful when we yank one set of leaders out and put a new set in and then reverse it a few years later. And also in a globalized world of increasing inequality in the midst of an accelerating climate crisis or of a pandemic, I really feel we can no longer separate meaningfully development, disaster and humanitarian crisis. And we can all see that cl climate impacts, disaster and displacement are becoming predictable facts of life around the globe. So disaster preparedness is required, but so is disaster risk informed development planning. Where and how could different typologies of disaster strike? Does development planning incorporate displacement and resettlement scenarios? Does planning for settlements, infrastructure, utilities or social services take relevant disaster risks into account? And I think we really have to bear in mind that voluntary return will not be possible for tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people who are going to be displaced by the climate crisis in the future. And it's happening now. New settlements will be required. So disaster risk informed development planning requires continuity and long term presence on the part of international partners, especially those designated to lead international operations in specific countries and regions. So it means having a cadre of humanitarians who know how to incorporate strengthening of resilience and durable solutions into emergency operations, including disaster displacement and camp management. Well, we're not there yet. And without this continuity, having been an RC and HC in several settings, I really don't think that strengthening the role of the RC HC or of adding durable solutions, strategies and appeals is really gonna make a difference. We need stronger integration, not the constant adding of further fractured solutions, strategies, appeals, or funding windows. Working in the last few years in a couple of country settings within national organizations, my impression is still that international development and humanitarian systems are as fractured as ever, and the magic of synergy remains elusive. Clusters are established at the disaster response phase. They last as long as funding lasts or until the humanitarian crisis is declared over 
or until a crisis somewhere else in the world sucks up humanitarians and humanitarian funding. At least for continuity's sake, I do believe that agencies should work together with their counterparts on a continuous and ongoing basis in whatever you like to call it, a working group, a sector group, a cluster, but they must be consistent and continuous in development and crisis settings. And they deal with disaster risk informed planning as part of development work and equally work on supporting resilience in disaster response and recovery operations End the artificial divide. Okay, third key area, sector based or area based. I mentioned sector coordination groups and obviously CCM is a kind of multi sector group. But what about area based approaches to disaster and, and dis related displacement. Well, I'd suggest that as a very loose rule, sector coordination makes sense at a central level. But as soon as you get to the subnational and local levels, overall area based coordination is necessary. But there are dangers. Experience shows that area based approaches of international actors, I have to say, can often exacerbate inequity, at least in service provision. Why do I say that? It's because coverage is uneven. Resources are not equitably distributed to areas based on need. And frankly, agencies tend to congregate in area capitals or in a few area centers where they have available services for them and where they can gather together. What does that mean? Areas of greatest vulnerability and need are often the precise areas that are the most underserved. So no external partner can succeed in local action without knowledge of context in its many aspects without accompanying and sustaining local lead partners, and be they in the private sector, civil society, or local government. And I think a community development approach is something that uh, can unite humanitarian development practice practitioners, and it can incorporate displacement sites and communities that host them. Okay, fourth key area, the issue of dignity at the center of humanitarian and development action. I think displacement sites in particular have huge potential for stripping displaced people of their dignity if there is too much of the handout and not enough of the helping hand. There's a world of difference between those two. So it goes without saying that at the core of camp and site management are the displaced people themselves. However, I have to say, I still think we're too guilty of asking affected people what they want or need and then of providing them whatever we have. They may not be the same. So when it comes to the issue of respecting the dignity of the affected people and of trying to support their priorities and resilience, even at the height of the humanitarian crisis, I'd just like to comment on a couple of things I've found over many years. There's an amazing consistency in what internally displaced people and refugees consider their highest needs. One is education for their children, because it's looking forward to a better future. And the other is a job for which they get paid some kind of wage and that provides them with the dignity of choice about how they spend what they earn. Of course, they need shelter now. They need food now. They need immediate attention, medical attention now. But they do want a job and an education for their kids. And the paid work issue is one which I believe more attention has to be given in the context of internal displacement. It's critical to choice. It's critical to dignity. Okay, I'm coming to an end. So a final few words on the fifth key area. Uh, our system, or whatever that is, and I want to take uh, four points on that, and they won't take long. One's the divide. It's been talked about quite a bit. So I think our system still encourages the divide between humanitarian and development. And there's more of a rupture than a liaison or merging of the two. Second, the issue of, issue of international dominance. I really think that, and I've been an HC and RC uh, many times, despite best intentions, and even when the cluster system is established together with national counterparts, government or civil society co-chairs, I think the international perspective still tends to dominate decision-making, or operate in parallel to national processes, central or local. This has to change when we see our role as accompanying counterparts. Okay, number three, the delicious topic of agency jealousies. Um, development and humanitarian organizations are still far too suspicious of each other. Whether humanitarian development or both, agencies protect their expansive mandates jealously, 
regardless of their competence or expertise in a particular humanitarian context. There's a rivalry for space, for control, for resources. Frankly, we've tried for years, if not decades, to resolve this, and we haven't. So I'd suggest that if the system were based on the principle of accompaniment, it would then force agencies to play roles much more based on competence, on relevance, and ability to act, and not just mandate. In addition, my experience has been that local partners are often frustrated by external agencies that arrive, whether at the central level or local level, with their mandates, their operating principles, their strategies, and their budget deadlines already established, regardless of context, community patterns of life, or seasonal variations. Time to change. Last point in, in this is the guaranteed uncertainty of funding. Some donors to the system have become flexible, but too many still compartmentalize their human development funding, which makes integration, smooth transitions, and so on, difficult, if not impossible. So to what extent is transition seen as just the time to quit with humanitarian resources exhausted to hand over to the unresourced development domain? So we know where that will go. So unless donors do stop desegregating uh, segregating their funds between humanitarian transition or development context, then again, I think all those special windows such as a durable solutions appeal or a special peace building, peace, building, peace building fund window for displacement, they're not gonna be much added value. Again, one of the strongest arguments for localization, accompaniment, local control, whatever we call it, is this very uncertainty of international fund funding. Local actors are gonna to have to take the lead. The insufficiency of funding guarantees that. So what's the point of ever more and larger appeals when it's guaranteed that they will be for the most part underfunded? So I'll end with a question and I am ending. Where do you in the CCM cluster draw the line between appealing for the funding you think you need but won't get, as opposed to drawing up realistic operational strategies with your local partners for operating with a 50%, 30% or less of the appeal total that you might actually receive? Thank you, Giovanni, for your patience. I know I've gone over my 10 minutes. We're not short of challenges, but as I hope you've noticed, I do think that serious adoption of the accompaniment or, or localization approach, above all, is one very concrete way of improving the ways in which we work and of improving the impact of our work. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nigel. A very good, very sharp reflection of um, the current status uh, of um, uh, the uh, humanitarian development uh, situation and, you know, some very interesting suggestions on how to move beyond uh, this impasse. So we're now at the Q&A phase. Um, I'm going to check quickly on the uh, chat to see. I'm going to read out some of the questions that came in and then we can discuss uh, who's going to take them. Uh, I think we have uh, a question on how should the durable solution phase be funded? Um, do current donors coordination mechanisms facilitate the transition between humanitarian and early recovery development phase? This is um, obviously a, a question uh, that has to do with that transition. Um, I Okay, here we are. In a situation of armed conflicts, peace processes are essential. With that, it's called triple nexus. Should we incorporate them in humanitarian and development operations? How would humanitarian remain principle and development work be neutral? So this, this is a good question. It, it talks about the nexus between peace, humanitarian and development, but it's also pointing to the the, the bitter or the delicate um, equilibrium between the principle of humanitarian work linked to, to the uh, key humanitarian principles and development, which is of course linked to, to, to the government um, uh, and the government in general. Question on, I guess, for Nigel, how can humanitarian accompany when the local level actors do not want to go with humanitarian principles? So many questions. I mean, this is really 
um, becoming very complicated. Um, let me read a couple of the last one. Uh, donors of humanitarian development uh, are sometimes directly and directly taking part in the conflict or siding with one party. How <clears throat> could development agencies invest in areas controlled by the donor's enemies? And I think finally, often the reason not to invest based on the need to move quickly when local administrators can be slow. So these are some of the points. I think you all can read them, Nigel, Oshang, and Charles on the group chat. What I suggest is that I give five minutes to each one of you to tackle um, you know, any of these questions that you like, any of these questions that you heard, and then we will uh, wrap up and hand it over to Van. Van is suggesting two minutes, maybe, maybe three, three minutes each, okay? Let's start with Charles. Over to you for the first reactions. Charles, you're mute. Yes, that's what I'm trying to, to counter. Uh, well, like you earlier mentioned, uh, uh, the questions are becoming so complicated. And, uh, and uh, however, uh, let me attempt to, to respond to, uh, to one of them that uh, is talking about, uh, um, what is it now? If you know, how can they bridge the, the, the development and the humanitarian uh, sectors. How do we? How can we bridge the divide between development and uh, uh, humanitarian sectors? Uh, from our own experience, uh, and I, I think uh, is about uh, the the strategies being developed, and uh, ensuring that the strategies do not only focus on on emergency based uh, response, but also to be thinking about uh, the issues of uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, the sustainable uh, intervention that can lead. Uh, uh, the, 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 the individual to, uh, to be self-seeking uh, self, uh, 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 self and the self-sufficient. Uh, and by doing that also, also by also ensuring that uh, infrastructural development is equally, uh, uh, is equally uh, involved in the intervention and, uh, and also addressing the, the context specific uh, 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 needs of, of the host communities in terms of uh, infrastructure and all those, so that uh, uh, the intervention of, of uh, handing, uh, giving relief, and all those will, it will lead to, and they also exit to issues of a uh, 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 sustainable uh, intervention that has to deal with the issues of a durable solution. I, I think this is what I can say on this particular question. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And over to Kak Oshang for his uh, closing remarks and maybe trying to answer some of the questions that came in. Yeah, actually it's, uh, I think some of the questions are very critical, you know, for the future interventions for the humanitarian and disaster and crisis management. So in regards to the development, uh, emergency and development, this has been an issue that we have been facing, actually. I highlighted, you know, when I said, not only from donor parts, also from politicians' part, they're thinking very shortly. So thinking about next elections, what they can do, you know, shortly, you know, to get, you know, to be re-elected, you know, uh, to be re-elected, you know, for the offices. And if you look at, you know, our case, since 2014, we have had, you know, four prime ministers, including the current one. So most of the interventions also from government side has not been, you know, strategic, long-term, you know, based. Most of them has been, you know, I can say short interventions, you know, this is one from government, you know, side. And also when it comes to the international, you know, donors, you know, we found that it has been affecting, you know, the, the long-term interventions, especially breaching the emergency humanitarian assistance to resiliency building and then to the next phase, you know, development. This has been a gap because uh, they mostly, you know, their funds is one time, uh, one year, you know, timeline, you know, to be spent, you know, or uh, stretched to the one-year budget or fiscal year. So beyond that, you know, the, you don't have, you know, any any uh, any leverage, you know, to extend, you know. Therefore, this is forced, you know, our partners right now, you know, uh, to think uh, the maximum, you know, long-term is uh, one year 
And one year when you're looking at the protracted you know, crisis, protracted displacement, one year is a very short uh, time. You cannot uh, link or breach you know, the humanitarian assistance, emergency you know, response to development. This has been uh, a critical issue that we have been facing and we have been discussing with the donors if they can, you know, commit to long term, at least, you know, five years, you know, to, to any, any strategy, any intervention, this could help, you know, filling the gap that still existing from humanitarian assistance and emergency response to resiliency building and also the development. This has been an issue and I don't think, you know, uh, there's any, any, you know, solution yet uh, or any, any, a shared, you know, and strategy between the donors and development partners and also aid agencies to come up with a, you know, strategy to, or a, at least a shared understanding how to fill this gap. And this is uh, critical. And another part regarding the questions, actually, it's uh, we have found that, you know, actually investing in the, you know, establishing the structures is much more effective to respond to crisis than investing in the crisis itself. I mean, emergency response, it's much more uh, you know, costly than if you invest in institutional resiliency building, uh, that investing in community resiliency building, you know, it pays back during the emergency, during the crisis, we have found that. And if you look at it, you know, what we have invested as an example in 2016, when we were developing a contingency planning, investing in institutional capacity building before the military operation to, rec to retake Mosul, we were easily, you know, we were easily in a coordinated concerted effort, helped around, you know, 2 million people within a couple of months and received 1.8 million, you know, IDPs. So no one was, you know, left, no one was, you know, without support either in the liberated areas remaining in their home or they were fleeing, you know, to the camps. Therefore, you know, the advanced investment in institutional and capacity building and also development of structures is also very critical, you know, to, to emergency response. And, uh, but uh, I will go back to the, you know, my, uh, the previous point when I mentioned about the transition, you know, for the uh, CCM or the camp, uh, camps, you know, to the next phase. For instance, in 2012, all of our leaders, so actually, you know, most even global leaders were thinking, you know, the Syrian crisis is a couple of months and uh, the regime will be changed, there will be smooth transition and ID refugees will go back. But now we are in 2000, almost the uh, end of 2020, still uh, we don't see what will be the future of Syria. And still there is millions of Syrian refugees, you know, in neighboring countries, in Europe, in other countries, and also millions of IDPs inside Syria. So if you go back to this thinking, this has affected, you know, the international interventions to be short-term based short-term strategy when it comes to supporting the displaced people, the refugees, and also the development side. Therefore, this thinking, you know, needs to be, to be revisited and to be reassessed, you know, to, to create a shared understanding, to fill the gap between the donors, between the aid agencies, and also the development agencies. So this is what I want finally to share with you about the my uh, view on the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oshang. And now over to, to Nigel. Okay, some very juicy questions. You said I've got an hour to respond? <laughs> okay, um, I'll just take three points. The one very quickly, you know, on this issue of how to invest in enemy control areas, whatever that means. Um, I'm, I could come back to that at some point, but uh, my work in Syria, um, the UN and agencies were working on both sides of the divide and I was working especially in rebel areas. Um, so I, I think there's experience in that um, 
probably too short now to go into it. I really want to take on two questions. One is the whole issue of bridging the divide between humanitarian development and linking up to peace processes and peace building. And the other is um, how to work with local actors, because a couple of questions came up on that. Um, on the issue of bridging the divide, um, how to do that, uh, I, I've tried to make the point that I think it's highly disruptive that we still maintain a kind of cadre of humanitarian actors and a cadre of development actors. And there's too little interplay between the two. Uh, I've tried to say that one of the things for the international community, whether it's UN, NGO or others, is a consistency of knowledge and understanding and presence in countries and the ability to move from crisis to so-called sustainable development and vice versa without totally disrupting the team, the psyche, etc. So right now that bridge is, is, is not there. Um, and I think especially if I can come back to climate change, which I mentioned and the climate crisis that's upon us, that totally obliterates any notion of humanitarian and development divide. Because if the climate crisis is real for your country, you have to take account of that in your development thinking. And you know that crises are going to happen. So division is meaningless. So the climate crisis is real. It's going to be part of the daily bread and daily development challenges of many countries. And as I said, when it comes to displacement, it's going to displace hundreds of millions and there ain't going to be no return. They've got to think of, 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 of resettlement and so on. Um, when it comes to peace building and peace processes, I've been, as you said, a, a DSRSG as well as an HCNRC twice. Um, and I do believe the things have to work together. Of course, uh, humanitarian principles have to be uh, respected, especially the humanity, the impartiality of the humanitarian enterprise. But I have to say, in my experience in humanitarian crises, which are not conflict driven, principles are sometimes used an ex as an excuse to remain apart from government counterparts. We're, we're impartial. We can't talk to government. I've heard that many times. That is rubbish. And we have to overcome that and work in a principled way with actors, be they government, non-government, whatever. And if you look at what's essential in the peace processes, one of them is the rule of law, which is critical to our success also as humanitarians. So it requires, and, and don't say that everybody who's working on the ground has to cover all the domains, but especially amongst the leadership, it has to be understood that there is an indivisible link between the peace process, humanitarian work, thinking ahead to longer term sustainable development. So we've got to have that whole view in our mind. Um, I, I, think, I think it's important. Now, there are a couple of questions. Um, how can humanitarian actors accompany local actors when they don't want to go with humanitarian principles? And local actors are often slow. Well, uh, frankly, I don't, I don't buy those as excuses for not working with supporting, strengthening local actors. You can always find local actors to work with. And again, I can go back to the Syria experience. In the areas I was working, few, no Syrians trusted the central government, which was obviously a predator. But they trusted their local municipal authorities. They trusted local groups. They trusted local private sector folks who were still providing wheat, etc. So we, we, were, we were able to work with those groups to develop systems of support and funding so that they could continue. Um, and we were able to negotiate. We, OCHA, working quietly in, in, the, in those Syria areas, was able to establish many agreements with some unlikely partners, even warring factions, on obeying human and humanitarian principles. Sure, they were often breached, but often they were respected. Um, so I think you can always find local and national counterparts to work with. Hopefully it's government, but if it's not, it will be others. If it's not the central, it can be local, regional, provincial, but there are always actors if we know the situation and we know what we're looking for. The second thing, in terms of local actors being slow, I wouldn't say that we're the, amongst the speediest either. We, we're very good at spending a lot of time doing our frameworks and our plans and so on, but quite often we're not the speediest in, in the world either. We can always find local actors to work with. But if we complain about them, I can tell you they complain like hell about us. 
whether in government, where they see international partners often as divorced from the national reality, or local actors who think uh, that, uh, that uh, NGOs, um, UN agencies are divorced from their community reality. So there are two sides to this, but coming back, the end of it is we need to understand context. We need to be there long enough to understand context. If we parachute in when a crisis has been declared, we don't know enough about context. Therefore, we're going to start off with a considerable disadvantage. There are many more interesting questions, but I will stop there. Thank you so much. Nigel, Kakosha, Charles, this has been an extremely rich discussion. I think that I appreciated it um, incredibly and I'm sure that the other participants to the call really enjoyed uh, what was discussed. Um, I think I would like to ask the, our hosts that we, we capture all the questions that came in at the end, if possible, and we include them in the final um, minutes of the, of the discussion, because these are questions that are also very interesting. And I think we should try to, to keep a record of them and, and, and keep them in the file for our further discussion. Because as I mentioned to you, this material will be useful and will be used uh, for the benefit of the high level panel. As I mentioned, we will be internalizing this discussion and bring them into the work of the panel. But obviously, as my colleague uh, Juan will say next, this will also be useful for the CCCM cluster, global cluster going forward. And she will now wrap up this session by giving us, you know, what are the lessons learned from this and what are the next plan when it comes to CCCM. Once again, thanks to our guests. It has been an incredibly useful and enriching discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giovanni. And I like a big, big thank you to all of our panelists. I think it's it opens such, you know, I think the questions that came in were so interesting. I think because this topic is so cross-cutting, and I think it touches so many of our like practitioners. Um, and you know, I think at times it seems a little bit insurmountable, like how we're going to approach this. But it's also really good to hear from, I think, um, Kako Shang and, and Charles about how different government at you know making roadway and learning and then you know facing challenges and and re kind of rerouting, figuring out different ways. I think um, you know. Uh, Nigel, you mentioned at the beginning that CCCM is, is cross-cutting, and I think the transition durable solution conversation is very much uh, cross-cutting with so many different moving pieces, with so many actors and stakeholders that needs to be involved, that needs to be part of. I really like the idea around, you know, localization. Actually, we should be talking about a company, accompaniment, um, you know, and, and how we approach working with local actors, with host communities, with um, national authorities. And I feel like it's almost like actually we as the humanitarian communities or the international humanitarian com communities are actually with them, you know, for the local actors. And I think we need to, to also accept, accept that roles. I think it's good to hear how we're able to provide technical support, um, you know, sharing lessons learned in the different contexts and location that we work in. I think we do, we're on the right step towards having a more contextualized, more localized um, approach to the response as well as coordination. Um, but, you know, we're still a long way to go, I think. And I think there was a lot of questions and discussion also around funding and a lot of messages also to donors about how does this work um, and you know we can't stop doing humanitarian humanitarian life-saving work while we wait for development funding to come in for example and i think the challenges to many of the country that are talking about transition while there's still ongoing humanitarian life-saving activities is is particularly challenging and, and you know, I think something that we hope we're able to support um, the different like government that, that we're working with. Um, I mean, I, I do think that CCCM does have, you know, our small but hopefully significant roles also in how we support communities um, towards reaching or finding solutions. Um, I think we form, we help, or oh, I guess, we, I, we hope 
that um, we facilitate forming of the relationship and discussions. And I think that we provide the platform and the forum for IDPs, for host communities, for local authorities, national authorities to sort of come together to discuss and, and looking at different possible solutions that can be had. And I think another really important thing that was brought up by, I think all of the panelists also is how important it is for preparedness action um, and planning to take place before displacement happened in order to allow discussion around transition and durable solutions to take place. So I think that we have a lot of takeaway from this conversation. This year, we're discussing and revising our global cluster strategy, um, as well as the, um, the year we're finalizing our uh, minimum standards for, for camp management, which I think there's a lot of takeaway from here that we hope we will able to integrate and, and be able to contribute towards these conversation in ongoing crises, as well as future ones. But again, um, thank you so much. And thank you for participants for your questions, your engagement. I know we went a little bit longer than we planned, um, but thank you so much for your time. I think it's been such a rich conversation. I'm gonna hand over to Charlie to remind us about what's coming tomorrow um, and look forward to seeing you all, you all then as well. Thanks very much, Juan. Um, so thank you also, Giovanni, but uh, particularly Particularly, thank you to our panelists, so to Nigel, to Charles, and to Hoshang. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom and experience with us. A quick reminder of what we have tomorrow. So tomorrow we get physical. We're looking at physical environment in a session led by Jim, um, but there'll be a bunch of other people involved in that too, who are too numerous to list at the moment. Um, I'm not going to do a, a feedback capture at the end of today because we did one this morning but I hope to see you at 1.45 Geneva time tomorrow for physical environment. Thanks very much for joining today. See you soon. Thank you very much. And thank you, Nigel, for sharing your morning coffee with us um, today. <laughs> it must be so early. Thank you, everyone. It's been really, really interesting, and I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Juan, for organizing it, and uh, all the others and the participants for their important questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike. Bye.